Hello. Uh, today, we are very happy to introduce the first episode of our sister podcast, Working Class Literature. WCL is going to be an occasional podcast taking a radical look at fiction and culture. We reproduce here the first full episode in its entirety about T-Bone Slim, a columnist, songwriter and poet in the industrial works of the World Union. So please do check it out and subscribe to the Working Class Literature podcast. Uh, it's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and most other podcast apps. You can also access episodes on the WCH website, workingclasshistory.com. You can support Working Class Literature on Patreon and get access to exclusive content like a great bonus episode about T-Bone Slim at patreon.com slash workingclassliterature. You can also get early access to WCL episodes and bonus episodes through the Working Class History Patreon if you subscribe at the level of $10 a month or more. That's at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Links to all this in the show notes. So anyway, hope you enjoy it. And if you do, uh, please do tell your friends about it and share it on social media. I'm as mild mannered as can be. On the 15th of May 1942, the body of a 60-year-old Manhattan waterfront worker was found in New York's Hudson River. The body was that of Matty Valentin Poikahuta, better known by his pen name T-Bone Slim, a prolific columnist, poet and songwriter for the publications of the radical industrial works of the World Union, also known as the Wobblies. Much like an earlier Wobbly, Joe Hill, who was framed for murder and eventually executed in 1915, Slim's work gained great popularity within the workers' movement and hobo jungle camps. But unlike Joe Hill, who became a folk hero after his death, Slim has since been unfairly forgotten by the movement to which he dedicated so much of his life and subsequently faded into almost total obscurity. This is Working Class Literature. He was breathing rather hard When he saw my union car He went wild, simply wild Welcome to the first episode of the Working Class Literature Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing the life and work of IWW author T-Bone Slim. If you'd like to learn more about the IWW, you should check out our sister podcast, Working Class History, whose episodes 6 and 9 cover IWW history from 1905 to 1950. In this episode, we speak to Dr. Owen Clayton and John Westmoreland, who've been conducting research on T-Bone Slim. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Owen Clayton. I'm a senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Um, I'm currently uh, working on a book uh, entitled On and Off the Road, The Writings of Vagabonds, Tramps and Hobos. Um, so I'm interested in, in transiency um, and the writings um, of, of transients um, and also the music um, and the culture of, of transiency, um, particularly in America, but, but in other countries as well. My name is John Westmoreland. I'm from Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and I'm a musician and songwriter who recently found out that uh, T-Bone Slim is my great-granduncle. The intro music to this episode was John's version of Slim's The Popular Wobbly, which we'll be playing more of later on. You can also find out more information about John's music in the show notes below. Slim grew up in America's notoriously left-wing working-class Finnish community at the end of the 19th century. He married his wife Rosa and had four children before leaving his family and becoming a hobo, working numerous jobs as he would until the end of his life. Uh, T-Bone Slim was a, a second-generation uh, Finnish immigrant. Um, uh, he was born uh, on Valentine's Day, um, so the 14th of February, uh, 1882. And he was born and raised in a uh, working-class family in uh, Ashtabula um, in Ohio. Um, it was known as, uh, known as Fintown. Um, he worked there in the harbour um, along with his, his, fam uh, his, his father um, and, and brothers, uh, the family moved to Erie, Pennsylvania, um, around about the turn of the century. Um, and then uh, Slim worked in the harbour in Erie as well, uh, along with uh, members of his family. Um, uh, he was a hoister, um, so he was hoisting goods um, and freight uh, on and off ships. Um, uh, he married uh, in 1902. Um, he married uh, his wife, Rosa. 
Um, they had four children. Um, and then we don't know exactly why, um, but in 1912, uh, he left the family um, and he became a, a hobo um, or, a, or a, a transient worker. Um, and three years later, um, Rosa um, successfully filed for divorce. Um, so there's this kind of mysterious period uh, in his life after 1912, um, pretty much the next eight years. We don't exactly know what he did, really, uh, uh, for most of uh, between 1912 and 1920. Um you know, he, he, you know, articles that he wrote uh, later in the industrial work and newspapers suggest he did all kinds of jobs, much like many hobos would have done. Um, he was a, you know, a lumberjack. Um, he was a, a gandhi dancer, um, which meant that, you know, he was putting down railroad ties. Um, there's there's a couple of accounts of him um, working as a cook, um, uh, one, one account in, in Oregon as a, as a camp cook, uh, and also a harvest laborer as well. Um, so he did all the, all kinds of uh, jobs and, and led, led this kind of hobo life for, for a, a large part of his of his early life, particularly once um, he left his uh, he left his family. As with everything with T-Bone Slim, there's there's uh, there's more uh, gaps than there are, you know, uh, bridges to the to the past there. There's a story that he uh, was working for a Duluth newspaper and did a was covering an IWW meeting and that he wrote his article on the meeting and then uh, submitted it to the editor at the newspaper and that they uh, botched up the story and that he was furious and uh, that he quit then and, and then joined the IWW. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a. Uh, there's uh, yeah I don't unless we find there there I haven't found any uh, you know uh, articles uh, from any Duluth newspaper I don't know of any newspaper that he worked for other than the IWW um, although I guess it certainly could be possible you know it's hard to say uh, so that's a story that's been passed around just as there's mostly that's what there is with T Bone Slim is there's stories and you can believe whatever you want to. <laughs> We don't know whether he became radicalized as a result of being a hobo um, or, you know, whether he became a hobo as a result of being radicalized. Um, we, we don't really know. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, in terms of his background, Finnish immigrants uh, had a reputation for being, you know, fairly left wing. So it's entirely possible he could have encountered radical ideas, you know, growing up in Ashtabula and Ohio or, in, you know, encountered wobblies and, and hobos kind of moving through those towns. Um at some point in between 1912 and, and 1920, it seems to me that he, he would have joined the IWW. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and around about 1920 is also when his, his articles first starting appearing in the Industrial Worker newspaper. Um, and the Industrial Worker newspaper was the IWW. Um, it's, it was their main weekly outlet as well. And what we do know, you know, we, we don't necessarily know a huge amount about you know, when he became a wobbly. Um, but, we, you know, what we do know from from his articles is that, you know, he's he was a pretty committed wobbly. Um, you know, he's he's very committed to, you know, the, the kind of wobbly vision of, of worker self-emancipation. Um, and this, you know, not only did that, you know, put him at odds with, you know, the mainstream American, you know, capitalist society, but it also put him at odds with, um, you know, the Communist Party and the, you know, the Leninist, Stalinist, uh, Communist Party and, and and also with the Socialist Party of America as well, you know, and, and 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 both of those kind of parties believed in you know having a kind of educated vanguard that were going to show the workers the path to emancipation. And Slim makes it quite clear that he's pretty scathing about that idea. And so he didn't hold an official position in a union, um, a kind of high up committee position or anything like that. Um, he, he was a long term member of the Wobblies um, and other unions as well. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, there are accounts of him taking part in meetings. Um, I think he was, you know, doing that as an ordinary member, you know, pr presumably in relation to matters that were affecting him as a worker. Right. So, you know, um, from the 30s onwards, he was working on the Manhattan waterfront. Um, so, you know, there are, there are accounts of him, you know, attending meetings, going to union halls. So I think he was he was he was active in that sense, but not necessarily as a leader uh, in, in the organizing sense. Um, but he was certainly friends with organizers. Um, so there's you know, there's an account of him being friends with um, the, the the prominent African American wobbly organizer Ben Fletcher in New York. Um, you know, for, they they Slim and, and Fletcher seem to have been friends. Um, but in terms of you know how significant Slim uh, was, I mean, I, I, he's extremely significant. And I mean, his you know his main contribution are, are the newspaper articles that he writes. Um, so he writes uh, weekly columns in the industrial worker um, and he writes occasional pieces in um, one big union monthly 
as well. Um, his work is also reprinted in Industrial Solidarity. So, you know, he's featured across a, a range of wobbly papers and, and the Industrial Worker um, columns in particular, they um, they appear almost every week uh, for over 20 years. So from uh, 1920 to his death in 1942. So he really was a very prolific prose writer. Um, and and we know that that you know he was well that people were reading him. Um, we know that radicals uh, and that hobos and, and 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 other workers were reading him. Um, there are, you know there are accounts of people saying that they only bought the industrial worker newspaper in order to read his column. Um, uh, and and in fact, there's even an advert um, uh, for one of those papers that says um, there's a lot more in industrial solidarity and industrial worker than T Bone Slim's columns. Um, which shows that, you know, they were aware that people were only buying those papers to read him. Um, you know, he was definitely their best writer and, you know, and they knew it. Um, there are accounts of workers, sailors um, exchanging Slim's uh, phrases and aphorisms amongst each other. It kind of reminds me of, you know, how like a worker today might, you know, like watch a comedy and then the next day they would be saying lines from that comedy at work, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and there, there's even an account of, of hobos writing Slim's sayings onto boxcars um, and then you know obviously those boxcars would then travel all around the united states so you know giving him a kind of physical uh, circulation um and one uh, one wobbly writer even uh, refers to slim as the laureate of the logging camps um so he was you know he really was well known very significant um there are actually anonymous poems written in his honor and published in the industrial worker as well so he you know he he did have this kind of legendary um, status really amongst the Wobblies in the 20s and 30s in particular. He seemed to be the IWW's most prolific columnist, um, you know, during his during his uh, active years of writing from 1920 until uh, his death in 1940, 1942, excuse me. Um, but uh, so I would say as, as a writer, he was he was, yeah, quite prolific and um, there was uh, Carl Cowell, um, who who was at one time a member of the IWW and I think later became a member of the Communist Party, um, was quoted as saying that he was a real adjunct of the paper um, and that he thought that a lot of people used to buy the industrial worker just to read T-Bone Slim. Uh, and uh, he'd say that you used to hear in the jungles the latest remarks that T-Bone Slim had made. Um, but it also he also went on to say that he was not often quoted in the non IWW radical press because he was popular and the impulse would be not to give credence or notoriety to a competitor. So he was a positive feature of an opponent movement. Uh, so that's from Carl Cowell um, from an interview that uh, was taped with Franklin Rosemont uh, in 1983. Um, Another little, actually, this is from the same interview. Uh, Carl stated that in regards to T-Bone Slim's writing, some of it was frankly obscure. I don't know what the hell he was trying to say. He dredged it up from the bottoms of his psyche. <laughs> um, and, and I guess his other contribution are his songs. Um, and, and if people have heard of Slim today, which they often haven't, to be honest, um, but if they have, they, they may have encountered one or two of his songs. Um, so the, there's, there's a few that are still in circulation today. Um, there's one called Mysteries of a Hobo's Life, um, which has been recorded by Cisco Houston. Um, there's the Lumberjack's Prayer. It's been, been covered by a few people. Um, there's even a Studs Terkel version. Um, and, uh, and, and the popular Wobbly is probably his, you know, his most well-known song. Um, that's been, you know, been covered by Pete Seeger and others. Um, and, and, you know, and, and Slim songs, you know, much like, you know, the far more famous Joe Hill, uh, Slim songs were published in the Industrial Worker newspaper and, and with the aim that hobos and, and transient workers would sing them, you know, would, would, would carry those newspapers with them on freight trains and then would sing those songs around, you know, jungle campfires and on, 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 on jobs. Um, unfortunately, uh, as far as we are aware, he doesn't seem to have recorded any of his songs. Um, you know, the technology certainly did exist at the time that, you know, in theory, he might have recorded something. Um, I've never heard uh, of, of such a recording. Um, and, and there is there is even an article I've read where he's he's very scathing of radio. Um, uh, and it kind of refers to it as a form of scabbing, which makes me think that um, he, he may have not wanted to uh, 
record. There are accounts of him, you know, giving kind of benefit concerts and, and, and live gigs. I do actually have in front of me an account of him performing on stage in New York City, which is quite, uh, I, I think it's quite entertaining. Uh, so this is a very rare account. We don't have many of these. Um, and this comes from a book uh, called Second String Red, The Life of Al Lannan, American Communist. Hoping to capitalize on lingering IWW sentiment among seamen, Al Lannan set up an open air meeting at Thames and Broadway featuring T-Bone Slim. Lannan gave the singer a big introduction, expecting the singer to open with his well-known popular wobbly. T-Bone Slim began yelling at the crowd about those fucking bastards down in Alabama who had framed the Scottsboro boys. An embarrassed Lannan hustled the living legend away from the microphone. So the yeah the Scottsboro Boys case was uh, 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 an infamous miscarriage of justice um, in American history, um, in which um, so uh, African American uh, men were uh, sharing a freight car uh, with uh, with white women. Um, they were basically busted by a, a railroad cop or a bull, um, and the white women, um, I think, partly as a way of protecting themselves made what um, in all likelihood was a trumped up allegation um, of, of sexual assault, basically. Um, so they kind of use their, their white privilege as a way of getting themselves out of trouble uh, in this interracial boxcar that they'd been in. Um, and it was this very famous, you know, miscarriage of justice. It was a, you know, a very poorly handled trial um, and, and, you know, which, which went on and, and that case kind of went on for years and was a bit of a, you know, kind of cause cool celeb in, uh, on the left and in the early 20th century United States. You know, so I've read a lot of hobo um, autobiographies and, you know, while many of them are, are interesting and, and in some respects admirable, there are also a significant portion of hobo writers who are basically white supremacists. And yet here we have an account of somebody at the same time who is, you know, blindingly angry about a shameful moment of racial injustice from American history. Right. And, and obviously that also fits in with the account we have of his interracial friendship with Ben Fletcher. So I think, you know, slim comes off fairly well. Um, I think we also get a bit of a sense of his personality, right? And shouting at the audience. Um, and I also love the quote because, you know, it, 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 it might very well be that Slim was one of the first ever musicians to refuse to sing his greatest hit on stage, um, which obviously lots of musicians uh, since him have done. One of the central themes that comes up frequently in Slim's writing is that of food, or rather its lack thereof, both in terms of quantity and quality. So he's he's super political, as you'd expect for for a wobbly. Um, you know the the thing he writes the most about, um, and you know his name is a bit of a giveaway here is is food. Um, so he he sees food um, and and hunger as being a kind of defining class experience. Um, so you know one one of his phrases he says, uh, labor has a bad habit of getting hungry. Um, right, but by by which he means that workers are kind of betrayed by their stomachs into performing, you know, exploitative labor. Right, without getting hungry, people might not, you know, agree to do this labor. Um, and and you know, he he talks a lot about how workers eat, you know, very infrequently. Um, you know, he says that meal time is an epoch in the history of today. Um, you know, that that it's a really significant event uh, in the, in the life of workers. Um, and and you know, that the hunger of the workers is what for him is to what defines them as workers. Um, and at one point, you know, he says that to appreciate his his humor, uh, his readers should um, skip a couple of meals before reading him. Um, and, you know, and he's aware that actually a lot of his a lot of his uh, readers actually were hungry a lot of the time. Um, he wrote a, a, a pamphlet, a kind of longer pamphlet, in addition to the you know various articles that he wrote. He also wrote a, a pamphlet, an expose of the food industry um, in the early 1920s. And, and he called that starving amidst too much. Um, which I think, you know, kind of highlights, you know, that, that for him, that the matter of food is a really political matter. Um, and he doesn't just talk about like the, the quantity of food. Um, you know, he also talks about the quality of food as well. So in that pamphlet, you know, he, he's he gets very angry about the marketing of um, cheap processed food um, for the working class, which was something that was really you know, just starting to take off uh, during his lifetime. And Slim was one of the first people to really pick up on that, that shift that was starting to take place. And, you know, one, one of his songs, The Lumberjack's Prayer, is all about that. The following track is a recording of Studs Terkel performing a reading of The Lumberjack's Prayer. Thanks to Bucky Hawker for giving us permission to use this version, which appears on his album Don't Want Your Millions. Check out the links in the show notes for more information. The Lumberjack's Prayer, by an old wobbly named T-Bone Slim. I pray, dear Lord, for Jesus' sake, give us this day a T-Bone steak. 
hallowed be thy holy name, and don't forget to send the same. Oh, hear my humble cry, O oh Lord, and send us down some decent board, brown gravy and some German fried with sliced tomatoes on the side. Oh, hear my cry, almighty host, I quite forgot the quail on toast. Let your kindly heart be stirred, and stuff some oysters in that bird. Dear Lord, you know your holy wish, on Friday we must have fish. Our flesh is weak and spirit stale, you better make that fish a whale. Oh, hear me, Lord, remove those dogs, those sausages of powdered logs your bully beef hash and bearded snouts. Take them to hell or thereabouts. With alum bread and pressed beef butts, dear Lord, you damn near ruin my guts. Your whitewash milk and oleorene, I wish to Christ I'd never seen. Oh, hear me, Lord, I'm praying still, but if you won't, our union will. Put pork chops on the bill of fare, and starve no workers anywhere. So the Lumberjack's Prayer is a song um, that follows in the, I suppose the, you'd say the tradition of Joe Hill's uh, Preacher and the Slave. Um, it's a parody of religion. Um, the IWW saw, uh, often saw groups like the Salvation Army uh, and, and other religious groups as kind of rivals. Um, so it parodies religion as kind of promising, um, you know, what Joe Hill referred to as pie in the sky, um, but doesn't actually, uh, you know, deliver in, in the real world. Um, it's got lots of different um, foodstuffs in it, uh, which T-Bone talks about a lot in his writings. You've got T-Bone steaks, you've got, you know, ham and eggs, quail on toast and, and so on. Um, but I think one thing that the song Little Jack's Prayer does uh, do that develops on from, from Joe Hill um, is it also critiques adulterated food. Um, which is something that is kind of uh, distinctive about about Slim. So it, it critiques um, hot dogs. Uh, it criti critiques alum bread. You know, this kind of food that's you know packed full of preservatives. Alum is a kind of aluminium-based uh, compound which was just used to um, you know bulk up bread to make people think they were full, but it actually um, you know wasn't actually full of any nutrients. Um, so your body wasn't getting what it needed, and actually was also related to um, cancer and, and, and other things, and had been used since the 19th century. And and you know Slim says uh, in in a little of Jack's prayer that this food has damn near ruined his guts, which um, you know was, is quite likely to be true. Uh, he talks about olearine. Um, olearine um, is basically the original term for margarine. Um, so olearine um, contains oil. OK, um, so yeah, another preserved food um, that's a kind of replacement for, for real food, which is butter. And Slim being a cook, of course, um, he would know that, um, you know, butter is much better for you uh, than uh, than margarine. Um, in terms of um, the kind of context for uh, the Lumberjack's Prayer, it was printed um, as uh, basically a fundraising uh, device on um, these cards that the IWW would put out. Um, so they would try and sell these cards. Um, they were 10 cents. Um, they said that the payment... Um, uh, the money for, for these cards would go out uh, and, and pay for the free literature that the IWW would put out. Um, so they were, they, they was, you know, Slim was, uh, was being used as somebody who could, you know, write an, an entertaining song that would make people laugh, make a political point, but also be used to, uh, to fundraise um, as well. Um, and one thing that um, in the recorded, various recorded versions, including the Studs Terkel version um, of the Lumberjack's Prayer that, that, is, is on the cards, but isn't um, actually in the recorded versions. Um, the Slim did also write uh, what he called an answer to the prayer, right? So he sets this prayer up as a kind of mock, you know, prayer to God, um, which is kind of ironic given that he's a wobbly and, and, and cr critical religion. Um, but then he writes this answer to the prayer, um, and he and, and and that's just a, a prose uh, piece, and it's just a few sentences. And 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 so uh, at the bottom of the prayer, um, Slim Slim writes this. He says. Um, I am happy to say this prayer has been answered by the old man himself. He tells me he has furnished plenty for all, and that if I am not getting mine, it's because I am not organized sufficiently strong to force the master to loosen up. He tells me he has no knowledge on dogs, pressed beef butts, etc., and that they are probably products of the devil. He further informs me that capitalists are children of his own the devils, that is, and that he absolutely refuses to participate in any children's squabbles. He believes in letting us fight it out along the lines of industrial unionism. Yours in faith, T-Bone Slim. 
Um, so even in this uh, answer to the prayer, um, you know, you've got God kind of answering and saying, well, basically, I'm not going to get involved. You know, you need to work it out for yourselves, um, which very much fits with, you know, the final lines um, of the prayer itself, where Slim says, oh, hear me, Lord, I'm praying still. But if you won't, our union will put pork chops on the bill of fare and starve no workers anywhere. Um, you know, that God isn't going to provide the answer. You have to do it for yourselves and you have to do it, in T-Bone Slim's opinion, through the IWW. Another interesting thing about the Lumberjack's prayer is how it mixes the modest with the luxurious, evident in how the humble cry for decent board quickly becomes a request for quail on toast stuffed with oysters. Slim is obviously playing around here, but the point he's making is also a serious one we want bread but we want oysters too um or something like that right and it's uh, you know and 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 yeah when he you know he's exaggerating he says you know dear lord we know your holy wish on friday we must have a fish our flesh is weak and spirit stale you better make that fish a whale um so you know he's, he's you know using this kind of comic exaggeration um to to yeah to make exactly that point well we do, you know we don't want you know just a fair share we want the whole thing um and we deserve the whole thing because we make it all Slim's prose writing was also very different from that of other essayists, particularly left-wing ones. So while, for instance, Orwell would go on to lay down his rules to prevent bad writing, like never use a long word where a short one will do, and if it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out, Slim, on the other hand, constructed a style of what he called coagulated verbosity. This involved mixing slang and workers' speech patterns with absurdist wordplay, sometimes through small neologisms where he fuses two words or ideas to create a new one, or otherwise in more extended passages. I, I guess what I would say is, is perhaps most significant, though, about Slim um, is that he combines this accessibility with this amazing talent for absurdist wordplay. So, it, you know, it's, it's really clear from his writing that he was obsessed with words. Yeah, he, he turns words around, he shifts them about, he makes them into something new. But I suppose, you know, I'd say even more significant is when he does it in more extended passages as well. Um, and it almost, uh, you know, starts to break down meaning in, in quite, um, you know, interesting and, and, and experimental ways. Um, so, um, so to give you a bit of context for this one, um, this comes from 1923. Um, and he's responding, as he often does, to a, a mainstream newspaper in which um, the, the newspaper has argued that abundance means prosperity. So then Slim picks up on that idea um, and, and he says this. Never has there been a shortage of abundance in these United States. Rather, it has been a case of too much abundance and too much is not enough. Too much is too much, just what it says. And enough is less than too much. Too much is more than enough and enough is never too much. Sufficiency isn't too much, but it is enough. So you can see yourself, enough is enough and too much is too much. Abundance is too much and not enough. Hence, it is a very ambiguous quantity to monkey with. Better stick to sufficiency, be it ever so elegant. And uh, it's all kind of there in that absurd paragraph, right? I mean, he's making these straightforward statements like, Enough is less than too much. Well, yeah, of course it is. Who would, who would disagree with that? But then as those statements go on, something else starts to happen. Uh, what Slim is doing here is, is putting that word abundance under pressure and putting it through a, a dialectical process. Um, and so that when he concludes abundance is too much and not enough, what he's saying is um, abundance provides too much for the bourgeois class and not enough for the working class, right? Which is why he says that abundance is a very ambiguous quantity to monkey with. Um, so he's, you know, he's translating very complex ideas here into language that's funny, accessible, and absurd. Um, and you know, and he does that without man without losing the complexity of the ideas. And I, I think that's a remarkable achievement. Also evident in Slim's writing is the breadth of his own reading, frequently peppering his columns with references to a variety of authors and poets. As, I mean, as a reader, um, I mean, he, he, you know, he, he's he's often making references to other writers. So, you know, he, he references um, Keats a lot. He, he rephrases sayings by Keats. Um, he, he references Shakespeare. He kind of plays with Shakespeare's name at times. And he compares himself on at least two occasions to George Bernard Shaw. 
Um, and you know, and he he says, you know, some people want to want to coax George Bernard Shaw, the other the world's other great writer, into this country, um, but the country isn't big enough for both of us. He says, um, and uh, you know, and I think I get the impression that although again he's being sarcastic, that he does actually like George Bernard Shaw. That's that's pretty pretty clear from what he's saying. Slim's writing also contains many parallels with modernism, which was arguably the most significant literary movement in America at the time in which Slim was active. You know, he does make a bleak reference to literary modernists um, uh, at one point. You know, he, he refers to the modernists as the, the rising generation of poets, which, you know, uh, does suggest at least a degree of familiarity with modernism as well. I don't have any kind of biographical evidence of him reading modernists, but I think if you just look at the, uh, his writing, I, th- I think you can see, you know, that, that he is being influenced by that. So um, and, and a common, you know, modernist technique is is defamiliarization. Right. So, you know, making the familiar seem unfamiliar. Right. So making readers look look again at something that they've, you know, seen for a long time and and taken for granted. And, you know, and Slim does this um, with with words in particular, words and ideas. Um, He likes to kind of reframe words and ideas so that his readers can see them as ideological. He also experiments with language in ways that, you know, can feel very modernist. So, um, yeah, he, he reproduces a yawn in print. Uh, at one point you know i'd love to be able to read that but i can't because it's a mixture of random letters and punctuation marks right so it's completely unpronounceable right so you can only see it on a page you can't actually speak it um uh, there are also uh, proto kind of surrealist moments um so he at one point one article uh, he talks to a woman whose body has completely disappeared except for a pair of red lips um and there's also another article where he has this long extended conversation throughout the entire article with a, with a sentient stone that is in a prison wall um, and, and you know the stones kind of on strike um, so these kind of surreal moments and, and also in terms of him playing with words you know he, he does this in in quite extended ways um, there's one article where he reproduces words that rhyme with omp until they just become kind of meaningless um, he, he does something similar in another article um, with the word soup um, and you know I think at those moments, I would say that, you know, he comes quite close to the writing of Gertrude Stein. Um, I've, you know, I have no idea whether he read Stein. I can't. It's kind of hard to see him liking someone like Gertrude Stein. But, you know, it, it, it comes quite similar to that. Um, and, 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 you know, like, I think partly, you know, this is like how he thinks. Right. He thinks in not necessarily a straightforward way. Um, but, you know, I think it's partly also because, uh, you know, he sees his readers as being intelligent. Right. You know, he you know, he knows he's writing for a working class audience. He's writing for workers. He's writing for hobos. He's writing for radicals. And, you know, those are groups who are who are kind of stereotyped in American society at that time as as being basically brutes, um, you know, as, as being unintelligent. Um, you know, and at one point he says, you know, I am not in the habit of associating with ignoramuses. Uh, he says. Um, so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, he, he he wrote in this experimental way, but he did it in a way that may, meant that, you know, he, you know, his his audience, his working class audience could still understand him. He didn't lose them. Perhaps due in part to the strong parallels with modernism, Slim's writing can also be read as an example of what French theorist Roland Barthes called the writerly text. So uh, Barthes' concept of the of the writerly text is is a, a self-conscious literary text, um, a, a text that asked it, its readership to do a significant amount of work, um, right? So a text that asks his readers to be, I guess you'd say, active participants in the, you know, the process of making meaning. Um, you know, so a, re- a really kind of obvious example of, of a writerly text is Ulysses, right? It's it's not just a, not just a book you can just open easily uh, and, 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 you know, breeze your way through. It takes, it takes work. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we often, you know, associate, I guess, modernism with, um, you know, with potentially with, with, with right wing politics and, and, and elitism. But, you know, I think for Slim, I think Slim is you know, he's always trying to make his readers into active participants um, because, you know, he, he thinks that what bourgeois writing like writers like Arthur Brisbane are doing is that they're doing the opposite. Right. They're trying to stop their readers from thinking and they're certainly trying to stop their readers from taking any action after they've uh, thought, which is where I guess you also get into questions around propaganda. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the new words that he creates uh, are to me an example of, of making readers work, um, albeit in a, in a very quick way, because you can't understand. He's created this new word by combining 
the two ideas inherent in, a, in two other words, well, you can't understand that new word unless you put those two ideas together yourself, right? So you have to do a little bit of work um, and and uh, in order to to create that, and he does that in a way that isn't you know it's not elitist, right? You don't you don't have to have a Harvard education to be able to do that, but you do need to put in some work. Um, and I would you know, and the same goes I suppose for the you know the proto surrealist and modernist elements of his work that we were just discussing as well. Um, you know, I, I think it's partly about making his readers work. Um, and for him, I mean, I think there is that link between you know between between politics and writing for him. Um, you know, so he's he's like constantly exhorting his readers to overthrow capitalism, right? And he's, you know, he's constantly saying, you know, that you can't rely on political leaders to do that for you, right? Because political leaders will always betray you. Um, and 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 for him, the same goes for kind of literary leaders. So he um, he, he says, uh, you know, um, this is a quote from Slim. He says, um, "A man is only great as a writer if his readers are great. Never was, is, or will be." a writer greater than reader. So for him, um, you know, greatness is a, is, is communal. Um, it's a kind of communal model of authorship. It's, uh, you know, great greatness is a, it's a relationship between writer and reader. Um, it's not a quality of individual genius. Um, so he, you know, if his, if his readers are great, then, then he is also great. Um, and, and, and earlier on, he also says, you know, no one recognizes better than T-Bone Slim the insignificant magnitude of the world's greatest writer. So, you know, if he's on his own, if he's taken as a as an individual writer, then his greatness is is it's an insignificant magnitude, um, which is, a you know, a, a really interesting phrase. So, yeah, that kind of communal model of authorship. That's why, you know, in the article, I, I've described his style as as literary anarchism. Since finding out about his great-granduncle's career as a poet and songwriter, John Westmoreland has been working on readapting some of Slim's music. Yeah, I, I pretty much right away started uh, working working on his songs. The first one I uh, was the popular Wobbly or Wild Over Me um, uh, because that one was so readily available online. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was just drawn to doing it because I'm a musician and songwriter. It seemed like the obvious thing to do <laughs> to me at the time. Um, and yeah, so I've I've been taking his songs and poems uh, that I've found in either online or uh, ones that are unpublished in uh, the material I I found at my parents' house. Um, as well as songs that are in the Newberry Library. And so, yeah, I've, so far I've been, I've really got, I guess, three three of his songs that I perform publicly now. And uh, there's other ones that I'm still kind of working on. Um, my hope is to do a, a full a full-length record of T-Bone Slim songs um, sometime, hopefully in the next, I'd like to have it out in the next year um, is my hope. And, uh, basically my process with that is that I'm taking his lyrics and, and then I'm allowing myself liberties to, to musically express things, uh, how I feel drawn to, to doing so. Um, as far as the, the chords and melodies, um, that I use. So my version of the, of the popular wobbly, is uh it's it's kind of it's a bit different than the than the than the more just standard version of it we're going to play john's version of the popular wobbly in just a second but first it's interesting to note the song's trajectory from the popular 1917 show tune which slim was originally parodying to candy caravan's readaptation of slim's version as part of the civil rights movement in the 1960s I believe the first version of it, which he used as his template to make uh, the popular wobbly, um, was was about the idea of the girls, like a, a, a the character in that song, uh, you know, the girls go wild over me, and that that's the whole uh, subject matter of the song, and so that Slim is clearly choosing that song uh, sarcastically, you know, in the sense of instead of you know, the girls are going wild over the man. It's, uh, it's the cop and the judge and the jailer, um, you know, and the bed bugs and the fleas. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I think that was clearly just commentary on he's taking some popular uh, uh, thing that he probably didn't think had much substance to it and is trying to uh, turn it around in a way that makes it uh, gives, you know, playing with the meaning that was originally there uh, around, you know, this, oh, all the girls just won't stay away from me. And, you know, so it's it's sarcastic, you know, oh, the cops, they just won't leave me alone. And the judge, you know, it's like he just goes wild over me. So, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, where Slim was coming from, perhaps. Uh, as for the 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 other versions, um, I mean, during the civil rights era, uh, it seems that it did have a uh, uh, th- that the song kind of reemerged uh, during during the maybe the 60s. Um, so in, in that version, I've, uh, you know, there was some new lyrics um, that were added in. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that, you know, my sense was that during that period, you know, they're 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 invoking the song. Uh, to speak to the, you know, to the jailing of of all the civil rights activists that were going on, um, which, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that that's a, I think that's beautiful that the song, you know, if the song has life, uh, you know, it's it's an amazing thing if if a song lives for more than a few years, you know, and outliving the the songwriter is, you know, uh, that's that's a, that's a it's a song that's got some longevity, and um, so I think it's a uh, it's a testament to the to the song that uh, that it did resurface in the '60s. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope maybe it'll you know get out there a little bit more these days as well. I mean, to me, just the vibe of the song is it's just a really beautiful uh, this kind of sense of this character who's never done any harm to anybody, not trying to cause anybody any trouble and just getting thrown in, you know, everybody's just going wild over him. And uh, so I, I find that just image to be poignant uh, as at just a basic human level of this idea of, you know, that this exists, that there's human beings that are not trying to cause anybody any harm, but just get caught up by these systems that are in place. And, uh, locked away um yeah I, I think unfortunately the song is very relevant that character does have this kind of innocence or naivety maybe um and then there's also these lines you know where he where he talks about uh the judge went wild over me and i plainly saw that we never could agree so i let the man obey what his conscience had to say i love that line that he let the man obey like what uh, so i just let him obey what his conscience had to say i'm not gonna I don't know. He's easy going too. Like, it's like, I'd hate to disturb the, the poor man's conscience. Like, no, I'll just let him, let him say what he has to say and he'll go wild over me. You know, um, there's a, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it really is a, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. And the last verse, the roses growing wild, you know, will the roses grow wild over me when I'm gone into the land that is to be when my soul and body part in the stillness of my heart, will the roses grow wild over me? Um, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful line. And there's a longing. It really expresses a longing, you know, that I think is really beautiful. So, yes, yeah, so this is my version of, of that song, the popular wobbly. I'm as mild mannered as can be, and I've never done them any harm that I can see. But on me they put a ban, and they threw me in the camp. They go wild, simply wild over me. They accuse me of rascality. But I can't see why they always pick on me I'm as gentle as a lamb But they take me for a ram They go wild, simply wild over me Oh, the bull, he went wild over me And he held his gun where everyone could see 
breathing rather hard when he saw my union car. He went wild, simply wild over me. Then the judge, he went wild over me. And I plainly saw we never could agree. So I let the man obey what his conscience had to say. He went wild, simply wild over me. Then the jailer, he went wild over me Then he locked me up and threw away the key Yes, it seems to be the rage So they keep me in a cage They go wild, simply wild over me They go wild, simply wild over me Referring to the bed bug and the flea They disturb my slumber deep And I murmur in my sleep They go wild, simply wild over me Will the roses grow wild over me? When I'm gone into the land that is to be When my soul and body part In the stillness of my heart Will the roses grow wild over me? When my soul and body part In the stillness of my heart Will the roses grow wild over me? Thank you. Thank you. The later years of Slim's life would see the declining fortunes of the IWW, leading him to note in 1937 with a typically grim witticism that we have the union, but no membership. This decline of the union to which he dedicated himself for so long was compounded by a life which was becoming increasingly difficult as old age, decades of hard manual labour and poverty all took their toll. Um, he settles down in uh, the mid-1930s in New York City. Uh, he gets a, a job as a, as a barge captain um, working on the, on the Manhattan waterfront. Um, uh, there's, there's an account of, you know, that says that you know, sometimes he would sleep aboard ship and sometimes he would stay in flop houses um, in the Bowery, um, you know, and, and the Lower East Side. Um, he was certainly always poor. You know, you don't stay in a flop house if you've got money. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's there's letters in the, the Westmoreland family archive uh, that, you know, that, that are in the possession of, of John and Cherie Westmoreland um, that, you know, where he's he's asking for money. Um, there's also uh, letters where he's giving money too, um, and, and letters that, you know, show he had some physical ailments as well, you know, problems with his feet and so on. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, he's settled down, but he lives, you know, a pretty hard uh, life really, um, you know, and, and obviously as he's getting older, it's even harder, right? So he's in his fifties, um, you know, uh, uh, at this point. Um, and, you know, and, and, and there's evidence that, you know, his, his life, you know, was, was difficult. And, um, and so, you know, just, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, Cherie and John Westmoreland and myself, um, we were, we were in, uh, uh, New York city, um, and we discovered that um, that Slim was arrested um, in 1939 um, for disorderly conduct, um, which, you know, indicates that, well, you know, may maybe there's a kind of lessening of control, you know, personally uh, happening. And then, yeah, like uh, towards the end of his, the very, very end of his life, um, 
there's a bit of, there's there's a couple of mysteries really so um his uh his weekly columns basically pretty much stop appearing uh in the final 10 months of his life um or, or, or almost completely so he you know uh, between 1920 and 1941 he is published in the industrial worker as far as i can tell pretty much every week um with you know occasional exceptions to that um between july 1941 and his death in may 1942 um his articles appear in only six of 45 issues um so there's a massive shift um there's obviously a number of possible explanations you know that, that could be the case for this could be ill health, it could be trouble with the law, it could be something else. Um, and anything, you know, I was to say about that, I guess, would only be speculation. But, you know, I, I guess it's it's clear that there are lots of, of questions that, you know, are still are still there with Slim. And, and hopefully one day we may get some more answers. The second mystery relates to the causes of Slim's death in May 1942. I mean, what we know is that uh, T-Bone Slim, uh, his body was found in the East River on May 15th, 1942, and that it was estimated that his body, according to the medical examiner's report, it was estimated that he was in the water for um, about four days. Um, and it has him listed officially as an unknown white male, um, approximate age of 50 years old, um, and that it said probable name of Matt Huta. So it looks like he was probably informally identified by someone. But again, we don't know who this, um, you know, pretty mysterious uh, demise, you know, has led to some speculation. Uh, you know, there's, there's been, you know, some speculation that he might have been murdered. I mean, you know, there's been stories that he was drunk and fell off the fell off the, the barge or fell off the docks. Um, but. I mean, I'd say that's, you know, and then there's been some people, there's been at least a, you know, a couple folks and that have commented that they thought that he was murdered. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it could be, who, who knows? I think it's really kind of speculative, uh, no matter what. Speculation about the possibility of Slim's murder forms a curious part of a novel called Savage Streets by Floyd Miller. A former New York seaman and member of the Communist Party, Miller had been gathering intelligence for the KGB in the 1930s and 40s on non-communist trade unionists active on the New York waterfront. Though primarily focused on Trotskyists, Miller would no doubt have been collecting information about wobblies like Slim as well. Miller's novel begins with the death of a, quote, philosophical wobbly who drowns in the river in what transpires to be a murder involving the Mafia and the Communist Party itself. John goes into more detail about these intriguing connections with Slim's mysterious death in our bonus episode, available now for Patreon supporters. Meanwhile, following his death, Slim would fade almost immediately into complete obscurity. It's it's kind of mysterious to me why he, yeah, he just kind of faded away very quickly after his death. Um, uh, I mean, the IWW did print an obituary for him, um, but it was about almost six months after his death had happened. Um, and there doesn't seem to have been any other remembrances uh, of him after that. Uh, you know, I mean, he was, uh, as best as I can tell, uh, you know, he was quite known in, in, in those, you know, in those particular radical circles at the time, uh, you know, because his columns were so, his columns were, widely read in, in certainly in the IWW circles and judging from people like Carl Cowell, it sounds like in communist circles and things too, that, you know, that uh, people in various unions would have been uh, reading his material. Now they may not have quoted his, his work uh, because he's from a competing union. Um, it's kind of fascinating that, I mean, I guess there is this mystique about T-Bone Slim that he was this, uh, you know, character that nobody really knew. And, you know, the people that I've come across quotes from that, uh, you know, say that they knew him basically in the same breath, say that they didn't know him, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, I knew him, but nobody really knew him. Um, and so that's interesting to see. I mean, I, I, it's not, you know, people have said that he was 
soft spoken um, and uh, kept to himself. So I'm really not sure what to make of it. Uh, it's it is it is it's it's the way things have gone down. He was buried on Heart Island. Um, so Heart Island is uh, is is off uh, is an island off um, off Manhattan. Um, so a few miles away from Manhattan. Um, he was buried on the fifth of June, nineteen forty-two, as an unknown white man. Um, Heart Island is America's biggest mass grave. Basically, um, it's it's basically a potter's field where people who are too poor uh, to, you know, to afford private burials have been buried ever since the 19th century. Um, he would have been buried by inmates of a workhouse that was on the island um, at the time that he died. Um, so, you know, it, it seems, um, you know, fairly appropriate or poignant, I guess, that, you know, he, he's somebody who wrote with America's poorest citizens in mind and then he ends up being being buried by them. You know, he was a really, uh, you know, a genuinely great working class author. He's extremely talented um, and he's been totally erased from literary history. And, you know, it seems to me, well, we need to rediscover that history, um, you know, and, and I think that rediscovery is an inherently political project. Um, you know, and he's a writer who is, you know, he's he is talented enough that he will bear the pressure of scrutiny and analysis. And that's why we need more people to look at him. Um, and, you know, not just scholars. <laughs> I can imagine all kinds of uses for him. You know, I can imagine artists, I can imagine activists using Slim in, in, in their work. Um, obviously, John Westmoreland is, is going to be creating an album, you know, of, of Slim's, you know, unrecorded uh, songs, largely. Um, you know, Slim is, is he's funny, he's punchy, he's sarcastic, he's ironic. You know, he's he's accessible, he's experimental. And, and you know, he never sold out <laughs> and he's not he's not perfect. But, um, you know, I, I think we have a lot uh, to that we can get out of his work. And um, he, I, I think we you know, now is the time he's been completely forgotten for three quarters of a century. Um, and now is the time to rediscover him. He was breathing rather hard when he saw my union car. He went wild, simply wild. That's the end of our first episode of the Working Class Literature Podcast. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it and talking to our guests. Links with more info on Slim and the IWW as well as John Westmoreland's music can be found in the show notes below. You can also find a link to the Working Class History online shop to buy a copy of the IWW's Little Red Songbook which contains some of the songs discussed in this episode. If you liked what you heard, do consider donating something to our Patreon as that will keep us sustainable and hopefully allow us to make episodes more frequently in future. Patrons will get exclusive early access to future episodes and can also listen to bonus content such as the one for this episode containing readings by John of two of Slim's unpublished poems as well as more on the peculiarities surrounding Slim's death. And if you can't donate anything right now, that's fine too, but if you could give us a great review on your favourite podcast app, that would be amazing as well. Anyway, that's it for today, and thanks for listening.